So you're listening to 94.4 FM, South City Radio, with your host, Jimmy Petruzzi, on the Friday Sports Show, bringing you all the news from the local area and around the world. And we're very fortunate in this show to bring you some of the world's best athletes, sports people, footballers, people who work in sport across a wide range of disciplines, coaching, training, analysts. We've got our segment, which is not so new now. We interview some of the world's most influential psychologists and in related fields, speaking about mental health and speaking about policy and speaking about their insight into it too. Today we have a very fascinating guest who's been at the forefront of his profession for, for many, many years. Um, I, where do we begin? It's such an uh, incredible career. I'm, I'm sure this will be really fascinating insight. He works at the moment in sports and business as a teacher, um, coach, uh, manager, mentor, uh, incredible career in professional sport and business over many, many years. Um, Steve Black, welcome to the show. Great to have you on board. Yeah, true. Glad to be here. So uh, looking forward to having another chat together. Yeah, I think. I mean, you've had an incredible career, Steve. I mean, a lot of people in the sports industry or outside the sports industry too, um, you know, uh, inspired by your your work. And I mean, yourself, you've worked in sort of professional sport, football, rugby. And no doubt other codes too. Um, where, where did it all begin with yourself, Steve? I mean, I, sort of, how did it all begin uh, for you in terms of um, your, your sort of career? You sort of you worked for many teams, QPR, Huddersfield. Um, you worked in rugby as well, Newcastle. Where does it all begin for yourself, Steve? Well, really, it, it, I, I loved I loved sport all my life. Yeah. And, uh, my, my father was a boxer, um, and. Uh, it, I was sort of brought up with it really, I was brought up with sport from an early age and training and that type of thing, at a time when not many people did that, mm. so the, you know, there were, gyms weren't widespread as they are now, yeah. and I remember going to the gym when I was six, seven, eight year old, that type of thing, but also the, the main mm. love of my life then was football, um, and I played a lot of football uh, all through my life, so, yeah. and, and I loved that, so it's at school it was, you know, football and cricket in the summer and athletics in, in, in the summer and, uh, and almost anything else I could try, really, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and so yourself, I mean, you worked in football, um, obviously, you, you know, you worked in football for a long time. And what were your experience? I mean, to, I, I mean, to, to work for, for Newcastle, what was the sort of, what did it sort of mean to you to work for, for Newcastle? Was it a huge like, opportunity for you or did you, how did you sort of, um, well, feel, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, it was, it was very interesting really because when I was a kid, I was associated with Newcastle. Is a, is a young player. Yeah. Um, did, did make it through. Um, but, uh, you know, it was very much part, part of my life. And I remember, you know, standing on the terraces in the early 60s and all that type of thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a big part of my life. And anybody who lives in Newcastle and who, who is interested in sport, it engulfs all our lives, really. So mm. the fact that I could go there and uh, contribute in some way was fantastic. So going from you know, having a, 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 a fledgling sort of football career there to actually go back and coach was mm. fantastic. Yeah. You know, there, there, there were, you know, I've had some great times through the years. So actually, I was first associated with Newcastle probably from the age of, say, 15, 14, 15. Mm. Uh, and uh, right through to sort of, I left uh, not too long ago. So, yeah, <laughs> so that's there's, been, there's been a, a lifelong association. Yeah. And even at times when, when I was doing lots of other things as well, mm. with lots of other clubs, uh, I, you know, I, I would still be on hand to chat to people in Newcastle and to offer advice and offer one to one help with people and that type of thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 this incredible sort of um, passion for for the football club uh, and Newcastle. That's for sure. And in terms of the, you, you know, you go across to rugby and, and sort of British and Irish lines. That's a sort of huge. Um, huge job. It's, it's you know, yeah. um, there's not many you know bigger um, teams, sporting teams in that in the world. And what was your experience like? What was that like to be involved in such a in incredible um, environment? Yeah, well, well, it was great actually. Um, from you know to turn to that different shape ball game. Um, what, what happened was Sir John, Sir John Hall, owned Newcastle and had a 
uh, wanted to uh, start out with a business mm -hmm. with Newcastle rugby and football and basketball and all other things. Mm -hmm. To be fair, this to Johnny was a visionary in that, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I was already had worked and was working in rugby. Um, through the years, but when it turned professional, I think I was probably the first person I told in, mm -hmm. in, the, in rugby in the, in the sense of the professional world. So um, I, I coached your Castle Falcons, mm -hmm. and we went from being in sort of a championship mm -hmm. to the Premiership. Uh, we got promoted the first season, second season we won the league and the cups in the Premiership. Um, I had five players in the British Lions squad in uh, maybe 97. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, yes, maybe 97. Sorry, yeah. yeah. So, um, and then um, I left Newcastle, uh, Falcons, and went to Wales, where I coached uh, the, the national team in Wales um, wow. with Graham Henry. And Graham was, uh, uh, you know, the eventual coach of the All Blacks who won the World Cup, etc. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and Graham had uh, coached at Auckland. And a few of the players that I had sort of coached through the years, people like Inga Tigabola, Pat Lamb, and mm. various other players, um, they were both coached. I had suggested to him it would be a good idea if he came to the Northern Hemisphere to contact me. Yeah. And uh, I remember going down and getting on a flight, going down to Bristol, meeting him, and uh, it was supposed to be like, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes. Yeah. And it was about sort of six, seven hours later, we sort of got up from the table. Yeah, we yeah. got on so well, it was fantastic. And, uh, really, really brilliant. Yeah. So we got on fantastically well. Mm. Um, and we broke the record for the century for the number of wins in a row for, for Wales, um, which was fantastic. But Graham then was given the job with the uh, English and Irish Lions mm. and asked me if I would, if I would go along. Uh, to support them there, which was uh, which was great. Yeah, so it would have been an, an incredible opportunity. With yourself, Steve, I mean, you sort of you, you worked sort of cross codes and. For any listeners, sort of any aspiring coaches sort of listening in, um, yeah, yeah. um, they'll probably be interested to, to know some of the differences in, say, I mean, we've seen, say, you know, the likes of Sir Clive Woodward, um, you know, many years ago, um, make that transition across the Southampton from, from Rugby Union. But in yeah. terms of yourself, I mean, what are some of the differences, Steve, in, in the two different codes in terms of uh, adapting yeah. to it? You seem to adapt really, really well to, obviously, to, to rugby. What, what were some of the yeah, yeah. insights to that? Yeah, well, it's interesting, really. I think I think what, what, whichever sport you're dealing with, uh, I coach people. Mm. So so whether it's it's boxing, um, you know, tennis, uh, golf, football, rugby, whatever, mm. uh, I coach I coach people. So uh, you know, I find out what the sport is and. Uh, I find out about the person and what their ambitions are and see if I can help um, support them in, in the road ahead. Mm. So that, that, that's the way it kind of works for me. Um, now, yeah. I think the hard part is if someone is, hasn't been in football before and goes into football and uh, wants to take the dressing room chats, etc. Mm. Uh, and wants, wants to actually be the coach of the team, I think that's difficult for them. Mm. Um, uh, both from a credibility standpoint, and also from the, the standpoint it's a different culture, and it is a different culture. Mm. Uh, so it, it, the same with rugby as well. So the, the, there will be certain sports and certain activities and certain business events in life that you would say, if you are mastermind, that's your chosen subject. <laughs> but mm -hmm. the, se the second leg of mastermind is always a general round. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think um, you can best serve the general round by sticking to base principles of, of having a good relationship with with uh, people or the team or whatever, mm. it'd be there to help them in every every way, yeah. and uh, for them to know that you have their best interests at heart and you really want to help them. Mm. Um, so when I, when I was asked at the time of when Clive went to um, Southampton, uh, could it work? Well, the answer is yes, it could have worked. Yeah. It could have worked because Clive wasn't really a coach; he was a manager. So and, and yeah. Clive went, went across there and. Um, the organisational part, had it been embraced, it just been the organisational part, I'm sure you would you would have done very well. Mm. Um, but to actually want to become part of the fraternity um, and, and be involved in 
sort the of football decisions, etc. Mm. If that was ever the case, um, that that would be proved a lot more difficult. Mm. A lot more difficult, really. Yeah, that's interesting um, points you've made there, Steve. Some really interesting points, and that sort of brings me to sort of yeah, um, yourself. I mean, you, you went in, you worked in, in in management yourself, assistant manager. Uh, was it Sunderland, Steve? You worked, you, you went in as an assistant manager. Yeah, yeah, with, yeah. Uh, with a friend of mine, Kevin Ball, who yeah, a, a, a good player, Kevin. And yeah. They had had coached him in Sunderland as a player, and I coached him down at Fulham as well as a player. So yeah, um, and, uh, it, it, when Kevin took over as, as manager at the end of a, a particular season where they hadn't done very, very well at all and they were already relegated, um, Ke- Kevin was given the uh, position for the last sort, I think it was 10 games of the season then. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I went in with him. There were some, there were some very interesting <laughs> things in the last 10 games there where, where we almost, to the public, had nothing to play for because they were already relegated. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but we decided to pay, play for personal pride, and uh, so we chatted together. I remember playing Manchester United down there uh, on a Tuesday or Wednesday evening, mm. um, and it, I think they'd won twelve in a row. And were catching Chelsea this particular season. Yeah, they were playing Chelsea on the Saturday, and they played us during the week. And you know we were top of the league and uh, uh, the, the team uh, had just hadn't done well there's no other way of saying it hadn't done well throughout the season um, they were seemed a good bunch of lads when, we, when I went there but they, they, mm. they just hadn't achieved through the season mm. and we took them down there and we drew nils each on a, mm. on a Tuesday Wednesday night and mm. it probably lost Manchester United in the league really to be fair because wow, yeah. they lost the game on Saturday against Chelsea and I think the fact that they've done so well and then they lost a couple of points against us in a, in a, um, a game that probably they should have won. Yeah, uh, yeah. Without, without any uh, shadow of a doubt. Um, yeah. Affected that. But it also showed a little bit what you can get out of people if you're emotionally attached to them. Because mm. um, the, the lads that were playing, probably not one of the players that were, were playing, all good kids. Mm. would have got in the Manchester United team or Manchester United squad at all yeah. but collectively collectively on, the, on the, the night they worked so hard together on and off the ball attacking and defending and in transition that uh, they made it very difficult for Manchester United mm. and probably deserved to earn the point you know yeah you know, it's interesting stuff uh, Steve, in terms of you know that you mentioned there obviously we see it in the FA Cup sometimes certain teams on the day um, yes exactly sort of, yeah, they galvanise themselves and go from there. At that point there, Steve, did you sort of think, well, maybe I might carry on in, in a similar role, maybe go for management in, in, in the game? I mean, what were you sort yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, well, I've been, offered, I've been offered a couple of jobs in, uh, in, in Spanish of clubs mm-hmm. uh, through the years. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it actually, our, our, some clubs I stayed involved with, Mm. And uh, when offered me the, the manager's job, or I helped very much uh, with the team, or behind the scenes, or with their coaches, or manager, or mm. you know, um, backroom staff, and all that type of thing. Um, so, in, in, in essence, really, if you look back through my career, there were probably quite a few times where I was actually probably looked at now as like a general manager mm-hmm. uh, there with the, uh, with, uh, with the team so um, but I still you know I still took training sessions on the on the training ground and uh, um, mm-hmm. team meetings and all that type of thing so it, I, I was satisfying uh, all, all aspects of, of um, how I operate anyway mm-hmm. <laughs> I was enjoying that you know I was enjoying being in the dressing room and being with players and um, Set the coaching in place and uh, analysing games and all that thing. Yeah, that's no, interesting, and I, I suppose for coaches listening, I mean, uh, to, to the show, they'll be sort of thinking, we've sort of seen the role of the performance coach, performance director over the last few years become more and more prominent um, in the UK and in sport in general. Now, yeah. the work you do, Steve, sometimes there's a good chance that 
in a performance role, we might not see the immediate effect. Obviously, you know, you go in there and, you know, there's that sort of X factor and, and you turn things around. And, but equally, yeah. putting the tracks down for, like, for, for later, putting, like, performance programs in there and that sort of stuff. And, I mean, I, I sort of think of the likes of, say, uh, Huddersfield and, 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 and that, you know, where, obviously, they've had, you know, uh, this sort of had you know a good good season um you know a couple of years ago we saw how well they were doing and i mean how much sort of work what's involved in a performance role steve it was sort of giving the listeners an insight to what you do as a performance director just so they have a sense of how yeah. you, you put the ground up for years to come well for, first of all it, 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 almost the same with any business really. you know you have a look and see what your resources are available mm. and uh, and see how um, how much capability you have um, to, to be able to deal with the tasks at hand type of thing now with a football team it's quite easy really because you've got to try and win games mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's that's a top point we're not waiting for share prices coming up and down yeah. the time. so you've got to try and win games so how do you do that well you prepare the players both uh, physically and mentally and you develop that so that they're robustly fit first mm. of all so they're generally fit they try to keep them healthy and then they become bespokely fit for how they want to play the game um, that's that's massively important so everybody mm. should have a different training program from a physical standpoint mm. um, that, that, that's the first thing secondly everybody should have a support a bespoke support as well especially at the top level in, in sport um, so so they have someone there who can listen to them who can uh, uh, advise if, if necessary um, mm. but who's, who's definitely there for them and there for them in a way that they're not there for someone else um, so you, you've got to be bespoke to the situation to the individual to the team to the coaches to the mm. manager to the environment in every respect so that, that that's a first sort of insight in the way there mm. um, so it, it shouldn't be um, you know just just print something off the computer and use that or use use something that's been used with someone else before mm. um, and, and just say well that that's similar so we'll use that there with that person you've got to get all that information of course you have you've mm. got to stay a perennial student um, but when, once you've got all the information you've got to best use it to help the player become as good as they can be mm. and, and obviously as good a team man as they can be Mm. So, what, what you tend to look at, you, you look at um, from a tactical standpoint, a strategic standpoint, how you're going to play the game. You try to fill roles in the most bespoke way possible. You know, so if, if somebody's good at something, let them be good at something. Mm. Don't, don't ask them to do things they're not good at. Um, and let, let's, let's work in, in ways on the training ground and off the training ground in classrooms and mm. uh, during games and all that type of thing where you're giving constant feedback to them. But it's, it's, it's generally, mostly mm. should be positive stuff all the time mm-hmm. it's easy it's easy to be a critic yes. uh, being a critic is dead easy there's, there's you know millions and millions of people in the world over, over who are brilliant critics uh, yeah. but, but finding solutions is more difficult so yeah. what, what you need to do to find solutions are you you think yourself in any aspect of your life when you've performed well yes. and you think you've done a good job you've probably felt good about yourself and you've yeah. probably thought well I'm pretty well prepared um, I know what I'm doing and I just need to communicate that to the people around me and that's a great start mm. so uh, that was very very important so you put structure in place so you de- as I say you develop the, the fitness you develop the skills skills are massive mm. and I don't think we're working enough on our skills really I think yeah. the skills should be if, if you looked at what you know what one of the people I've been associated with for lots and lots of years Johnny Wilkinson mm. uh, he works so hard on his skills all the time mm. you know incredibly hard on them so you know from a, um, a, he's passing and he's kicking and he's moving and he's game understanding which is his skill as well game intelligence mm. so you understand the game and you know and you make good decisions and you execute them well mm. so uh, that, that all comes into the mix really so yeah. if and I, I use a term from japanese um, business management kaizen from quality, uh, quality control really on the game and quality control on the training where we look at getting better all the time 
yes. continual improvement, you know? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. So you continually look at that, always have to. So if, if throughout their playing career, players should get better. They should they understand if the game should get better. Mm. There's no reason why somebody could play up to 35, 36, 37 and, um, and be absolutely functional in every respect and not mm. have to alter that game that much really if, if, they, if they train probably mm. now obviously if they go beyond that they'll probably have to use the game intelligence a little bit more than their legs mm. but, yeah. Yeah, absolutely but, yeah yeah but at the same time so wherever you go you've got to do that so you've got to come and have a look at um, the team and mm. say is this team well organized are they fit yeah. are they healthy do they look like they're enjoying it? Yeah. Do, do, does that show up in that performance? You know, it yeah. tends to show up when uh, people being disciplined and they're, they're generally generally in transition work. Mm. So uh, you know, transition from attacking to defending and vice versa. Mm. You know, if there's a spark there and if there's a sense of urgency um, to the team, then you've got a big chance because mm. that allows you to bring your skills into play and to. Uh, to, to, to play well and get good results. Mm-hmm. Now, that's, that's really interesting stuff, Stephen. For me, it's like interesting. Like you know, I mean, I think having sort of spoken to to, to many many you know um, you know great coaches of the years, and one thing that sort of strikes me, Steve, that you know, um, like yourself, it's like you, you sort of there's like a common theme. You, you, you come across as like a humble person, and it's not you know people like Johnny Wilkins have spoken really highly of you, and, and you work with some, you know the world's best athletes, and you know often many many years but you still got that sort of you know that, that sort of Newcastle um, you know um, it, it sort of I mean obviously you know um, it completely professional and, and, and uh, you know and cut every stone but there's like a degree of humbleness do you think that's really important as a coach to sort of stay grounded and not let it get to your head and sort of you know um, to, 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 yeah. to be that way yeah well I do I do think I think it's a, it's a, a nice attribute to try to have in life yeah. Uh, but there's, there's, that, there's that thing ego that interferes with us all by the way because no matter how, how humble you try to be or if you have all those characteristics um, there's, there's a reason why you work with the best athletes and the best teams and the best businesses in the world mm. and you strive day and night to help it get better and maybe see your ego has got something to do with that as well by the way so we've all got ego mm. you know so, so uh, uh, but Really, as long as you care for uh, for uh, other people, and you must never hide how much you care. Mm-hmm. You must never hide how much. You know the old cliché statement's a great one. Mm-hmm. Uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. So you know you may write clever clogs, but if people don't think you're doing it for the right reasons and you're doing it to help them, they'll probably not listen. Mm-hmm. It's the same as if you're a teacher or a lecturer or whatever, and you've got the students in class. If the students don't like you and respect you, then they'll probably not listen to you, to the, uh, not focus in the depth that they probably should. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, so the, that, that's very important. But, but ego, ego plays a big part as well, by the way, in all mm-hmm. that we do. Yeah. In all that we do. Yeah. So it's, uh, and sometimes people think ego can get in the way. And it can get in the way mm. at times mm. if, if people go over the top of that. But Absolutely. just from, uh, from uh, the standpoint of ego, you know, you want to satisfy it and you're driven and all that type of thing. Um, a lot of that can be very useful. Mm. Absolutely, that's a really powerful takeaway. You know about the, the the sort of quote you use there, Steve. Any sort of young coaches listening, or anyone you know in any profession, about sort of um, you know caring is, is a big thing. And you know, I think we sort of you know we live in a world sometimes where we sort of get carried away with sort of um, you know knowledge, and, and it's great. But like he says there, uh, it's, it's it's really important to sort of. But you know, see, yeah. the, the, one of the big important things is, you, but you can't just love people. Mm. You cuddle them all the time. Mm. Uh, 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 because it's different. Also, you've got, uh, whatever you're working with, you've got to know the game. You've got Absolutely, to know the business. Yeah. You've got to know what good looks and feels like. And yeah. then you've got to communicate that. Absolutely. So, what, yes. yeah. you know, so you've, you've got to know that. You've got to know that, uh, uh, where the person's been and how the, you know, where the people are up and what school was like and what, what the friends were like and all that type of thing. You've got to know as much as you can about them in every regard. Mm-hmm. And then you've got to give yourself to them, to um, support them in every way that will bring out the best in them. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. Um, in, in, uh, but yes, by the way, that's even business and everything. Mm. People tend to do better, make better decisions if they're, they're doing something that they love and enjoy and have a passion for. Um, and if they love and enjoy and have a passion for it and they're working in it, you tend to find that they're probably relatively well skilled. Mm. You know? Mm. Now, if, if, you, if you take that relatively out and you become well skilled, well, very skilled, then that's going to be a bonus, hasn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And absolutely. then if you sit in dressing rooms and you're looking around the dressing room and you say, I'm glad he's there, I'm glad he's there, I'm glad Jimmy's sitting there, mm. I'm glad he's in this dressing room with me because he's a good person. He's a, he, you know, he's a, he's a, he or she in, in, in the game, they're good people. And they want to do well and they, they've worked hard and they've prepared properly and so they're ready to perform. And you say, well, that's, these, are, these are big things you've got to work towards. And sometimes we're trying to complicate these things. Mm. And, it's, uh, and, and I'm, an, I'm an obsessive, so I read everything and, and talk to everybody and listen to things and read research and everything else. But it still comes down to how much people want to engage together, how much people truly want to collaborate with each other, the camaraderie there, and then being able to gel their skills and gel their abilities to produce a great team performance. Mm-hmm. That's that's really powerful stuff. And uh, just uh, on, on a final, uh, Steve has been really thankful for you know, sharing your time. Is that I mean, you've been sort of in this industry for a long time now, at, at the highest level. And and what what's your sort of vision going forward? I mean, you, you seem as motivated now as ever. And sort of in terms of yourself, is it sort of more of the same, or what sort of drives you to sort of carry on at the level you're at for so many years? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think. Uh before they put me in my box, I think I was <laughs> I no, no attention of, uh, in fact I can't even say that word, what, what is it again, I forget what it is, something about uh, retain, 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 oh, I can't even say retain, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not keen into that, yeah, yeah. I'm continually, I'm not con- I'm continually uh, working to get better and better, yeah. I continually work to try and service all the relationships I have and to build new ones, uh, I take great pride in what I see athletes, teams or businesses thrive, the time that I'm supporting, I really love that, um, I probably, <laughs> you know, people who want coaches or uh, mentors or managers, etc, probably don't realise how much you actually get as a reward, mm. an intrinsic reward. So you know that people do well, the one mm. who it is or what they're doing. And that, that's, that becomes over time even more important than extrinsic reward that you would ever receive. Mm. Um, and, and Absolutely. Then, especially if you're, if you're getting older, and I'm in my mid-60s now, uh, it's, it's becoming more and more important. It probably has done, you know, through the years, really. Mm. It's really gone that way. Um, so, uh, but for any, uh, uh, you know, inspiring coaches out there, aspiring coaches out there, mm. uh, both, um, d- just keep caring. Yeah. Just keep really caring. Don't get bored with doing the right thing. Mm. Do not get bored with doing the right thing. It has not got to keep changing all the time to be good. Mm. If it changes, it's got to be better than what you're already doing. Mm. So if you're doing something and you want to change it, change it for, for good reason. Don't mm. just change because it's it's in vogue to change. Mm. You know? Now evolution's got a little, little bit of a clue there. <laughs> yeah, as yeah. far as things will change, it's a, you know, yeah, will yeah. change. But actually it's surprising how much really that uh, of, of stuff that you've done all through the years still works. Mm. It does still work. Absolutely, yeah. That's powerful it's, stuff. It's so, and you've got to remember when we started, there was mm. a, a manager a coach, a physio, and, uh, and somebody to make me tea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, now there's thousands of people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, that, and that's good because all, uh, you know, uh, just about all, the vast majority of those people are great people. They're lovely mm, people. Definitely. They add to the environment and everything. But don't forget that people were still able to play football and rugby and everything else with a very small support group. Mm. And as, as with everything else, while, while I think we play our role, and I really do think that, mm. it would be remiss for me not to say that, um, it's all about players. 
Definitely. No, that's, 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 that's you know, fascinating stuff, Steve. It's been great uh, having you on the show. It's just, you know, been, you know, fascinating insight into, into, into your sort of career and philosophy. You know that our listeners have really enjoyed it. That was Steve Black, professional sports and business leader, teacher, coach, manager, mentor, has been at the forefront of his profession for many, many years and, and no doubt many years to, 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 to come as well. So um, Friday Sports Show 94.4 FM, South City Radio, your host in Petruzzi. Uh, fantastic, Steve. Really appreciate your time and wish you all the best. Thanks again. Thanks very much. It's been lovely talking to you and uh, all the best to your listeners out there as well. God bless. Thanks, Steve. So you're listening to South City Radio. The Friday Sports Show with your host, Jimmy Petruzzi, bringing you all the news from the local area and around the world on South of City Radio, 94.5 of him. The Friday Sports Show with your host, Jimmy Petruzzi. And we're very fortunate in this show to bring you some of the world's best athletes, sports people. We also have a segment that we cover speaking to some of the world's leading professionals in the field of psychology and related field, uh, fields. And we've had some very interesting guests come on board and share their perspectives. So this evening we get an international perspective. Um, we're sort of in the middle of the cricket season at the moment. It's been an interesting season. And we're going to get some perspectives um, from different sports around the world. And the, this evening we've got a really fascinating guest who's you know, played at the, at the highest level and, um, and also coached as well. So we'll get a, a really interesting insight into what it's like to coach and, and play uh, as well. So uh, Joe Dawes, welcome to the show. Great to have you on board. Yeah, that's great stuff. So, really interesting, um, Joe, yourself, you're the high performance manager, head coach at cricket, uh, Papua New Guinea, PNG, and, and the Adelaide Strikers senior assistant coach. But tell us a bit about the role um, with, with, with PNG. That seems like a really interesting role. I mean, I, I know you guys sort of qualify for the, uh, the T20 uh, in 2019. What an incredible achievement that was, and, and to be uh, on the sort of global stage. But tell us a bit about the role and sort of how things are going on there. Yeah, man, it's, it's a very different role for me. I've had it before in some respects. It's, you know, I've been lucky enough to work with uh, you know, teams in Australia and teams in India. They so are full of resources and, and, and facilities and things like that where it's obviously very different here, not being in that top tier, just being in the, the tier underneath. Um, yeah, our resources aren't not the same as those, so you're always looking at ways to try and do things actually a little bit cheaper and uh, a bit easier. And then, then also here you've got, you know, Papua New Guinea is a, well, I'm not sure the right term is a third world country, but it's not far away from it. So you, the, the cultural issues and, and the education and the language barriers here as well. Now, that's really interesting you say, and you mentioned uh, India as well. I mean, you, you know, you were the, the bowling coach out there, and, and obviously India's got a strong cricketing tradition and, and, and has produced some great uh, bowlers. And when you're sort of reflecting back on sort of your experience in India, um, uh, we've seen like some incredible fast bowlers like Bumrah, um, you know, come through over the past few years, and. and the list rolls on. What was your experience like out in India and, 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 and as a bowling coach, uh, Joe? Well, I really enjoyed it. It was great fun. It was obviously to work with the, the biggest cricket team in the world, the most fanatical cricket team in the world. It was a fantastic experience to you know, to walk from the team hotel to the team bus every morning and have you know, five, six, seven thousand people outside just waiting to catch a glimpse of their heroes. Wow. Uh, it was yeah. pretty special. It was, it was, it was good fun. Um, very, obviously very different culture to home with a very big spin focus. So trying to raise the, the profile and the importance of the fast bowlers in that group and their education about not just being there to service the batsmen, but actually, um, you know, winning test matches mm. and, and trying to have a real impact was, was a good challenge and something I really enjoyed. That's no, really interesting, and we are, obviously India is always a, a tough place to play um, in terms of their home record is, is phenomenal. But in recent years, we've seen them, you know, travel uh, away. And do you think that the pace bowling has helped them in terms of playing um, a, a abroad as well and being really formidable at home? Absolutely. I mean, you look at their pace attack now. Um, when I was there, Dishant was there, and we had. Uh, Shami, Umesh Yadav, uh, Bhuvaneshwar Kumar, um, those guys 
coming through and, and, and the Nofshi with Boomer coming through after I left. Um, you know, they've got a world-class pace attack now and mm. um, actually they've always had great spinners and, and always will have, especially in their own conditions. And But I think Virat Kohli is, is the key there. He's really taken an aggressive mind set mm. that team um, to get out of... This is how India played... Um, but actually, no, we're going to get out and going to have a red-on crack at countries in their own country and, 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 and be aggressive in the way we play their cricket. Yeah, that's really interesting stuff. And in, in terms of yourself, obviously, you've sort of, um, you know, played at, at a high level for, for sort of, uh, for Queensland and, and you know, had like, you know, uh, you could call it a, a, a golden period for yourself where you've taken a number of wickets. Um, uh, you sort of averaged a fantastic, formidable average. I think it was, was, was what, 20, 24 and 9 and 7 and last time I looked it up. But, um, but that's an you know, incredible average to have. And you know, when you played cricket in Australia, it was a time when competitions were places, I mean they're fierce now but back then, I think from my perspective anyway, in my opinion it was, you know, a lot more tougher in terms of breaking through but describe your time at Queensland um, Joe, for our listeners, obviously what it was like to play in an era of Australian cricket where you had just so many players to choose from um, for international level but also domestic cricket um, was just incredibly strong and yeah, you know, thank you for the kind words about my career. And when you look back, you know, I'm very proud of it and, and went all right, I guess. But it was just hard enough getting a game for Queensland back there. I was competing with, you know, your Michael Kasperwitzes, Andy Pickles, Adam Dales, um, you know, Scott Muller played for Australia, Ashley Nofke played for Australia while I was there as well in that period. So it was just hard enough getting a game for Queensland, let alone getting a game for Australia. Um, and. Uh, you know, in, in the end, that didn't happen. I wasn't good enough to play at that level. But I think anyone that earned a, earned a bag of green during that period absolutely had to earn it because it was that was the year where they were you know, winning 16 test matches in a row and that sort of thing. You know, that was an incredible side. Incredible. And in terms of like domestic cricket, when you played against the other states, uh, what was it like in terms of competition? I mean, was, was it tough? Obviously, uh, some of the international cricketers uh, would, would play for the state occasionally, but what was the sort of, how would you sort of um, judge the competition at the time in terms of competitiveness um, compared to now? And it's hard to com- compare, obviously, eras, but in terms of the intensity, was it an intense time to play state cricket? Oh, mate, absolutely. I think you know, everyone's going to say, back in my day, aren't they? <laughs> You know, you always want to be wary of that. I, I don't want to judge the, the modern stuff because I don't play it. But the, yeah. the, newer, the newer stuff, the current stuff is probably a better way to put it. But, you know, you, you speak now to the guys about team meetings where you talk about the opposition batters and you get to number eight and then nine, ten, eleven was just trying to break a finger uh, mm-hmm. or, or break an arm, you know, so they couldn't bowl. And as a poor bugger that batted number eleven, it wasn't a great deal of fun. <laughs> the receiving end of it so um, yeah it was tough it was hard cricket and you were playing guys that were everyone was competitive trying to get into that Australian side and show their way and there was a lot of players that had you know been there and been in and around that Australian system they were playing so it was yeah it was great there's a lot of good players you know you go back to obviously Martin Love for us but you had Jamie Siddons and Brad Hodges and these sorts of guys that you know, in any other year, it would have played potentially 100 test matches, and they were they were running in domestic cricket every day. Um, so it was it, it was a great time to be involved. Yeah, and that's really interesting. And just like you know, for our listeners' perspective, in terms of cricket at that level, um, at that point, did, did cricket reach an era when you were playing where technology had an impact? In, in the game, I mean, I speak to certain people who are involved in the game now, and they talk about how they've got plans to bowl to certain um, batsmen or batters. And, and was that the case when you were playing, where you sort of sit down and look at technology and think, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of look at these weaknesses and exploit them, or how, how did that work? Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, you know, at, at, in Queensland, we had well, the first part of my playing career. We had John Buchanan before he moved on to the Australian set up and we, we also had um, a guy there named Jim Hunter who went on to with his brothers create a company called Fairplay which does provide 
the analysis software for all of Australian cricket and, and quite yeah. a lot of other countries around the world. And, um, that started at Queensland Cricket, so we were probably the first to have access to that. And it mm. started out as you know, a pitch map with a whole bunch of circles on it um, to have a look at where you're bowling to, to what it is now where you can look at video. I can actually get on the Cricket Australia um, app that coaches have and I can go back and have a look at footage from when I played. Um, you know, mm. it's an amazing system now yeah. that you, you can anal- have a look at and analyse just about any sort of stat or or, or theory you might have on how you want to get a batter out. So we had that. We had our team meetings. It was always a bit of a joke that, you know, you'd walk out of a bowler's meeting and the, the batters would say, oh, the corridor hasn't moved. You know, <laughs> still bowling at that off stump. Or, yeah, yeah, or yeah. Bounce it, bounce it, you know, pitch one up, get them out sort of thing. So, um, you know, I, I think it's... I think it's important. I think it's it's a great element of the game. It's something I do enjoy, but something you don't want to um, overanalyze or you know the mm-hmm. paralysis analysis stuff as well. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I, I find that really interesting. I'm sure the listeners as well would do in the sense that you know technology sort of moved moved sports in general forward, sports science and, and, and psychology and obviously analysis as well. But there is, like you said there, the you know the, the common sense factor too. So obviously if you sort of spot something while you're playing or um, just having that sort of intuition to, we've seen some of the great cricketers sort of intuitively um, you know go out there and sort of exploit a weakness or just, just sense the moment. I mean the one thing that the analysis I suppose can give you is sort of when you've got the sort of crowd behind you or, or for example there's this sort of moment in the game um, where you can seize initiative and did you guys sort of have make plans but occasionally sort of veer off there and think well actually you know what we'll give this a go or did you sort of stick purely to the plan oh no, no you have to be adaptable don't you you don't yeah. you might have a uh, plan for, um, for, for someone and, and on that day the you know, you're hoping for a quick wicket and it's it's slow, you know, so you can't bounce Darren Lehman out or have a cricket trying to bounce Darren Lehman out potentially, so you've got to come up with a new plan or, um, you know, the ball goes soft early because it's just a bad ball, and you know, so it's not getting through, so you've got to adjust to that. Um, yeah, uh, you know, every good cricket team or sporting team is, is adaptable and has to be on the fly. Um, um, in, imperative and in terms of yourself obviously you know you, you played in, in the UK as well and, uh, and, and Middlesex and so you, you probably well placed to sort of at that point make comparisons in terms of the the, the league and what would you say was the difference between the Australian domestic uh, league and, and sort of county cricket Joe at that point obviously there was a lot of debates at the time in terms of um, over in the UK about the, the, you know county cricket and what changes they could make I think a lot of it was down to obviously the, the, you know, there was one of the greatest Australian teams of all times, and it's a tough benchmark to compare yourself to. But what would you say in your experience at that point was the difference? I, I found it, I only had the, the one year of county cricket. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, getting to play at Lords uh, every other week was pretty special. Um, but I think for me, the big part was it was just a survival thing in that at home, you know, you'd play a shield game and have potentially, you know, two weeks off before the next one where um, I, I still, the, one of the big memories of my trip at Tom Middlesex was, you know, we won our first four-day game that I was there and at home we could, you know, you'd have a, have a beer and then have, you know, five, ten more, twenty more of them um, <laughs> where within sort of half an hour of the of the win, I looked around the dress room and everyone had packed their kit and gone. And you realise, well, shit, you know, we've now got to get in the car and drive from London to, um, mm. you know, Manchester and play a one day game tomorrow or something like that. So mm. I, I think it, it, it was a grind, it was an, an absolute grind. Mm. And, and so the, the level of sort of competition at that point. Would you say the level? Yeah, of, how would you sort of compare the, the level of competition to sort of bowl at in terms of uh, the, the batters? Would you say that um, that maybe with with the uh, Australian domestic cricket being a fewer teams, um, obviously fewer teams are playing as well, um, and in terms of the, the sort of quality to be to, to play at state levels, you know, obviously really really tough. How would you sort of compare from a, from a week to week basis? You know, bowling at the uh, the, the, the batsman. Oh, I think home home 
the top five. Um, mm. Again, I still think it's tough, be hard because the um, you know Canterbury you didn't see a lot of the, the test players. We did see a little bit more of them back home. I think at that stage. Yeah. Um, I, I also think it was you know there's very different conditions with the, the wickets and things. But I think home was was tougher because it was more of a again I go back to what I was originally saying there. It, it's more of a you know we've got a game in a week you can really focus to where. Yeah, just yeah. that daily grind. I reckon can take the top edge off of performances because it's just I've got to get up and do it good again tomorrow. I've got to get up and do it again tomorrow, sort of thing. So yeah, um, I think it's really hard, especially from a bowling point of view, to run out and bowl fast for an entire county season. I just don't think you can physically do it. You got to pick your moments and things. That's an interesting sort of perspective there. I think that you know, obviously, uh, our listeners listen again and um, you know find that interesting. Really, to sort of maintain that intensity, we see at international level. Obviously, the uh, the, the games are more congested now, so it, it's no doubt it does take its toll. So, just to give us an insight to what it's like as a fast bowler, uh, Joe, what, what's it like as a fast bowler in terms of physical uh, intensity? You mentioned there that you sort of play a four-day game and then you you, you drive up the motorway and you've got another game and physically does it sort of take its toll on you I had this conversation with a coach the other day about with all these sort of new training methods and these new ideas about keeping sort of injury free what's it like on the body uh, week in week out as a fast bowler fast bowling is going to break you anyway mm. um, it's just the nature of the beast yeah that's uh, interesting yeah. I think it's you go, mate. Yeah, no, it's interesting because like, you know, we've probably got some listeners, that, uh, in, a lot of listeners involved in the game and some young players who are making their way in the game and coaches too will be sort of thinking this is sort of priceless, you know, in, uh, in terms of speaking to someone who's played at the level that you've played. And I think that's really interesting you say, sort of keeping things ticking over. Obviously, everyone has what, what works for them, whether it's sort of a walk, um, you know, get some fresh air or go for a jog or a swim or whatever works for you. But it's really interesting you say, sort of keeping things ticking up and biomechanically I can imagine that being a fast bowler takes a lot out of the body. Did sports science have a big influence in, in sort of your preparation Joe yourself? Did you sort of you, you sort of played in the era where sports science became prominent like for example you know the, whether it be an ice bath or going for a swim or whatever? Yeah we, we didn't have the workloads in our day which to be honest I'm, I'm thankful about I'm, I'm not sold on on that in a lot of regards. I think there's yeah. some really good parts and, and you understand what they're trying to achieve by preventing injury. Yes. Um, yeah. But I don't, I do, and there's a very generalised statement, but I don't think it as a science is specialised or individualised enough. It's In a lot of cases, it's just a one, one-stop one shop to tick a box. Um, yeah. You know, for me, I like to bowl a lot. And... Um, but that doesn't, you know, again, that doesn't mean that that's going to work for everyone. Um, Absolutely, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, it's what, had, yeah, what we'll the ice bath and things. Um, I just find the, the science stuff quite interesting in that, you know, when we played ice bars with the, the way forward and, you know, they're going to be, um, they're going to help you recover and everything else. And, and now, and, and, and for quite a while, the, the actual science on that has been... Um, yeah, it's not 100%. It's not mm-hmm. proven one way or the other that, that there are benefits. So. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point, Joe, and, and our listeners sort of listening in, especially the, the younger players. Um, I think it's important to sort of evaluate um, what works for you as well, um, you know, common sense as well, and, and science changes too, um, which, is, which is a big thing. Uh, for sure, definitely. And in terms of yourself, you know, at, at, at Papua New Guinea, PNG, what's your vision going forward? I mean, you've experienced success there, you've done a fantastic job there. Um, I mean, obviously realistic with the resources and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm pretty sure I watched a documentary a while ago um, on, 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 on uh, cricket over there. It was I found it really fascinating. But where do you see you guys going from, from, from where you are now? Yeah, you know, we've qualified for one World Cup now. Um, you know, our vision as a high performance team is to consistently qualify for those. Um, you know, our girls have narrowly missed out on the last two T20 World Cups, so that's a real focus for us at the moment is to get our girls to the I think 
it's the T, uh, 2022 T20 World Cup. Um, uh, you know, right. We don't have grand illusions of being a full member nation and um, playing test cricket and that sort of thing. I mean, really, we only play T20 in this country. Um, you know, so we want to continue to develop our 50 over cricket with our men. Um, continue, you know, we're in, we've got our ODI status. And we want to improve with that. We've just introduced a new 50 over competition here so that we, you know, I've got guys that last year that made their debut for the Barrow Mondays and played seven um, 50 over games so it was seven ODIs last year and I asked him how many he played in his life and he said coach I probably played five outside of these ODIs um, so you know, we're asking young men to open the batting in international cricket having mm. played five 50 over games in their life so wow, uh, yeah. uh, it's a real challenge so that's, that's for me is the big thing is get that and then also ensure that um yeah, really make myself um, irrelevant in a lot of respects by bringing up, uh, bringing on the national guys from a coaching perspective and, and getting mm. the players to think about themselves and, and drive their own game. Mm. So as a coach, you know, they're driving it and I'm just helping them steer the ship occasionally. So, And that's a, that's a big challenge up here because it's not something they've been open to and it's not how their education is and... So it's a real challenge, but that's what we're trying to get to, and I think we're slowly chipping away at it. Yeah, and that's interesting stuff, and, and, and obviously, you know, it's sort of, you, you sort of set the benchmark qualifying for the T20, I think, in some respects. Do you think that, is there a bit of extra sort of pressure there, Joe, sometimes? I'm not saying it's like a victim of your own success, but the expectation changes. I mean, it's an achievement to get there, and once you've got there once, it's like, okay, um, that's what we're aiming for. Do you sort of find a, a, a bit of extra pressure then to sort of um, to fulfil that expectation? I think, um, you know, we've qualified for obviously what was Australia, which has now become the Indian World Cup. There's a T20 World Cup the following year yeah. back in Australia. Um, I think that global qualifier will be the big one for us because, yeah. you know, we've, we've done it once, now we'll be expected to do it again. Um, you know, I, I think the flip side of that, though, is that the boys have the confidence that they know if they stick to our processes and our, and our plans and back themselves that, and play their style that we can we can do do the job and qualify for World Cups and mm. um, yeah we go to India we have no advantages about winning winning the World Cup there but we want to make sure we would like to go to the second stage and if mm. the draw stays the same our second game would be against India. It was going to be at the MCG. And wow. Yeah, who knows where it'll be. In oh, yeah, but, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. For our guys here, and I was only telling them about this the other day, for them to play India at, in Calcutta at Eden Gardens in front of 90,000 people, well, that's something you will never, ever forget in your life, obviously. Absolutely. And it'll be, be amazing. Yeah, well, and, and, no matter what. Yeah, that's been an incredible experience. You know, you know, some of the box office superstars of cricket there. That'd be an experience you sort of be sharing with your sort of you know grandchildren. That's for sure. But in terms of the um, yourself, you've coached obviously women's cricket too, um, Australian women's cricket. There, they've always been a strong team traditionally and and what would you say in your experience of some of the differences this is uh, we have a lot of coaches listening to the show and, and, and you know some coach uh, at, at different levels and and, and sort of cross colors and, and you know um, women's teams as well and in your experience Joe what would you say were some of the um, the differences if any between coaching a uh, women's team and, and a men's team in terms of adapting yeah. I had to stop swearing as much as I normally do. That was the first <laughs> yeah. thing I had to do. Uh, but first, of all, I absolutely loved coaching uh, the, the Aussie women's team. It was great fun. We had a really good crew with the coaching staff and the players, and there's still have a lot of friends with the uh, the, the players today. Um, yeah, and it helps being the number one team in the world. You're winning far more. Absolutely, yeah. Great fun. Um, but the big thing, I guess, was. Uh, probably the the cricket knowledge, you know, most boys grow up, you know, watching a lot of cricket, they're playing cricket in the yard, backyard and the driveways and at school and everything like that. Uh, the girls haven't been ex exposed to as much cricket, so they, 
not quite there with the cricket education or the, mm-hmm. the, the game sense. Um, also, that um, the, the different types of communication with the girls, you know, you know don't have the egos of, of, of the blokes can have. The girls mm-hmm. are just really, really, really keen to learn and, and are sponges. Um, but yeah. you have to take the time that they want to you know, verbalise it and talk about it more um, which can be a challenge I guess for a guy that's not a big talker um, but that was again part of the, the skills you learn as, as a coach with them um, having to change your game plan from a bloke um, you know from, from men's cricket especially from you know playing on the Gabba and, and yeah. playing most of your cricket on bounce rickets where you go oh, we'll just stick it up and push them on the back foot and then pitch it up and try and nick them off or hit them on the pad well you know obviously bowling a bouncer for the girls is much harder work um, yeah, yeah. So that was, you know, having to do that and, and taking the pace out of the game with the ball from that point of view where you, you don't have that pace where someone's running in and really blasting um, players out. So and having to be a little bit more patient and a bit more subtle with your plans with the girls, that was, again, yeah, no, that was a great challenge. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was great fun. I'd love to go back and, and work in women's cricket again. I, you know, I was actually glad to did a session with some of our girls up here today and they're just good fun because they just want to learn um, and uh, you know, I'd recommend any coach that you know, thinks there may be a stigma or something attached to women's mm-hmm. cricket, get involved it's good fun and you, and you get a lot out of it yeah, absolutely. I think it's great stuff, and also sort of encouraging you know the, the, the girls to participate in, in the game as well. I think it's you know cricket's a great game as well, and I think that you know any sort of you know girls considering playing cricket that are listening in, and you know there's, there's, we've sort of got a number of local clubs in this area to get involved in, um, whether you end up playing for the national team or whether you play for just recreational. I think it's it's, it's a great sport. Uh, you know, getting involved is the key. Um, and you know who knows where the, where the road will take you. But it's been really interesting speaking to you, Joe. It's been you know some fascinating insights. No doubt the listeners have sort of um, taken a lot away from from sort of hearing you speak and, and sort of been very kind and generous to talk about your own experiences and. And I think that, you know, certainly uh, we have a strong sporting community that listens to this show. So I really want to thank you, Joe, for coming on board the show uh, and sharing your insights. It's, it's been great to join South City Radio 94.5 in the Friday Sports Show. Your host, Rumi Chooza, that was high performance manager, head coach of Cricket PNG and Abaya Strikers assistant coach as well. So thanks for joining us, Joe. We wish you all the best with PNG. Now that we'll keep an eye to see how you guys get on. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It's been good fun. Thank you.